Perfect, thank you. Willie is our uh, wizard behind the switches and who is helping us to broadcast this session in a um, good manner. My name is Willem Boot. I am the um, Gießen Coffee Roasters ambassador. And today I am very happy to be able to discuss a topic that is, um, yeah, I would say very, very actual, very important. Right now, um, at this moment, we are at the beginning of a uh, conference held in Glasgow, an important summit where the um, existing climate crisis is being um, discussed by world leaders and interventions that we all as human beings on this planet can consider. And I'm going to share my screen um, and I'm now going to share my slideshow. Okay, so now at your end, you should um, see uh, the beginning of this slideshow of this presentation. And um, I think we announced that the um, webinar would focus on uh, roaster emissions, but we actually decided to take this um, uh, to a more comprehensive topic. And it's basically about calculating, determining the carbon footprint of your coffee company. Whether you are a, a retailer, a producer, uh, an exporter, or a roaster, I think carbon footprint and understanding how to go about calculating um, this carbon footprint is really key. And in this slideshow, I will, in this uh, webinar, I will share some perspectives on you know, what is the carbon footprint? How do we approach that? Um, how do we determine which elements in our activities are part of this carbon footprint? And then very specifically, I'm going to highlight some, some aspects, some important uh, details of uh, this carbon footprint uh, and how to calculate this um, at your, yeah, in your own company, in your own business. And um, so what is carbon footprints? So historically, the carbon footprint has been defined as the total set, the total amount of greenhouse gas emissions, also indicated as GHG, caused by um, your organization, your company. And it is probably also an extension of a um, concept that was uh, developed and introduced uh, back in the 1990s, so um, uh, more than 30 years ago, by an ecologist called William Rees at the University of uh, British Columbia in Canada. And that concept of the, what used to be the ecological footprint, and which is now considered the carbon footprint, it's really an important and powerful tool to understand the impact of your behavior, of your company's behavior on climate change and through climate change, on um, some of the yeah, symptoms of climate change which is global warming, changing weather, weather patterns, and a lot of um, other related aspects. And so if we then define and try to approach a calculation of the concept of a carbon footprint, it's really the sum of all emissions of CO2, carbon dioxide, which were created, which were induced by your activities over a given time frame. Usually, um, a carbon footprint is calculated for the time period of one year. And if you look at 
different options, different types of um, fossil fuels like petrol, gasoline, diesel, and oil. And if you take one liter of this uh, fuel, then you can um, calculate the, the CO2 that is emitted per unit of this fuel once you start to um, allocate it, once you start to use it for your um, economic activity. And in this case, you know, um, in the coffee supply chain, in the production chain of coffee, um, besides roasting, if we go back much earlier in the value chain, there are all related steps where some form um, of mechanization is typically uh, applied. And if those uh, motors or if those machines are driven by um, gasoline fueled or diesel fueled motors, then you can tell you know, that for every liter of fuel you use, you will be um, producing, you will be creating CO2, carbon dioxide. So um, take something simple and um, uh, for, yeah, very uh, practical like a car. So if your car consumes seven and a half liters of uh, diesel per 100 kilometer, then if you would be driving 300 kilometers, then your diesel usage would be uh, 22.5 liters of diesel, which adds, uh, if we then multiply that by the amount of the equivalent of CO2 emitted as a result of that activity over the journey of 300 kilometers traveling with your car, you would be creating, you would be adding 60.75 kilograms of carbon dioxide of CO2 to your personal carbon footprint. And um, you know, there is a whole range of activities that we can identify that at one kilogram, one single kilogram of CO2 to your personal carbon footprint. Um, if you travel by public transportation, you can um, uh, equal that to, it has been calculated that this, with the diesel usage typically of uh, public transportation of buses or of trains, that you would be um, um, able to travel 10 to 12 kilometers in order to add one kilogram of CO2 to your carbon footprint. Or with your car, you could drive a distance of six kilometers or 3.75 miles, assuming that your usage would be 7.3 liters petrol per 100 kilometers. Uh, with a plane, you could travel only 2.2 kilometers or you could be using your computer, assuming this computer uses 60 watts uh, of energy uh, for 32 hours. Or you could be looking at the production of five plastic bags or two plastic bottles. You can see these plastic materials are quite um, energy uh, intensive. Or you could equal this one kilogram of addition to your carbon footprint as one third of an American cheeseburger. I can tell you, I'm, I'm not a great fan myself of cheeseburgers, but um, this is in the US, which is uh, a very important uh, market for coffee and for any other type of consumable goods. In the US, it's quite a popular product. And so what are, again, these greenhouse gases? They, these are those gases that can absorb and emit infrared radiation. And infrared radiation um, uh, will contribute, obviously, to climate change and to the warming of the environment. And the most common, the most abundant 
greenhouse gases in the Earth's what, what atmosphere are water vapor. Um, but water vapor is relatively um, innocent in this realm. But carbon dioxide, that's of course a direct contribute, contributor to um, the greenhouse gases. So it can contribute between 9 to 26 percent of the greenhouse gases. Methane, CH4, 4 to 9 percent, and ozone, O3, 3 to 7 percent. So carbon dioxide, what is that? It, it's, it's a, a so-called greenhouse gas causing climate change, causing global warming. Um, and as I already mentioned, other greenhouse gases, which um, might be emitted as a result of your activities are, for example, methane and ozone. Um, and these greenhouse gases are normally also taken into account for your carbon footprints. And they are converted into the amount of CO2, of carbon dioxide, that would cause the same effects on global warming. This is also called the equivalent carbon dioxide amount. And so climate change is the ultimate effect of large carbon footprints. And greenhouse gases, whether natural or human produced, contribute to the warming of the planet. A good example is um, methane that is um, um, kind of stored, locked into the large plains in Siberia because of the, um, these plains gradually warming up we expect uh, massive amounts of, uh, over time, massive amounts of methane gas to, to release, to come free. And these are um, developments that are quite hard to reverse, quite hard to um, promptly to influence. But of course, this is also why the Glasgow summit is so important. We must look at options to um, reduce our consumption of uh, um, these fossil fuels or become smarter in how we use them. Now, taken from 1920 to the world as we know that today, 2021, we can see um, a really dramatic um, increase in the annual CO2 emissions. And this is the result from the burning of fossil fuels for energy and for cement production. The change of land use is not included. So for example, uh, deforestation and forests play an important role as we, as we all know in converting CO2 into oxygen that is not taken into account. But we see basically from let's say the 1940s up till today, we see a more than 700% increase in these annual CO2 emissions. And so, as I already indicated, climate change is the ultimate effect of large carbon footprints. And Greenhouse gases, as I already indicated, they contribute to the warming of this planet. From 1990 to 2020, carbon dioxide emissions increased by 41%. And in four years from now, if we make up the balance, we can see a 45% in radiative warming or a shift in Earth's energy balance toward warming. And um, I don't know if you read some of the reports that came out in uh, international newspapers this week. Um, we saw the latest UN report that there is an increase on average of one and a half degrees centigrade to be expected over the next years versus the numbers that we saw earlier in the last century. So this is very serious stuff. Um, now, where do we 
um, emit, where do we generate these CO2 emissions? Obviously, and mostly in um, industrialized states and uh, countries like the US, um, China, India, and then in some countries in um, Northern uh, Europe. And Brazil, we see a fair amount, um, Australia to some degree. And then in the lesser developed countries, let's say in Africa, you can see the lighter colored indicators really indicating that their CO2 emissions are at a much lower level. And so if we look at the overall outcome of that, of climate change, then these large carbon footprints that deplete resources on large and small scales from a country's deforestation activities, like we've um, seen in Brazil as a result of uh, the inaction or the counterproductive actions of the president in Brazil related to deforestation that this adds tremendously to the carbon footprint of Brazil, because it has been calculated that in fact, the forests in Brazil start to tend to um, convert significantly less CO2 than they ever did before. And this obviously generates a very uh, important of a, a very um, dangerous situation. There are all kinds of uh, calculations uh, that have been made. Um, I'm, I'm just looking at if there are some questions coming in. I'm keeping multitasking here. So there are comparisons that exist um, where it comes to carbon emissions of other products than coffee in this case. Now, it's well known that the meat, the beef, the ground beef on a burger, coming back to the cheeseburger example again, that the ground beef of a cheeseburger really adds tremendously to the carbon footprints of just that burger of um, 1910 grams. So this all the energy that is required to produce beef in terms of the food that these cows eat in terms of the processing of this food, this adds tremendously to the carbon footprint. We also have the bun, the salad, the condiments, etc. Now, let's talk about coffee now. Let's talk about the coffee cycle. Um, what, what do we see in the coffee cycle? Which steps do we see? There is a really helpful um, a visualization of the economics of coffee that outlines you know, what contributes to the total cost of a cup of coffee. I'm not going to focus on the cost analysis, but I'm going to focus on the individual steps that are part of this analysis. So the first stage, we have the growing of coffee. So in the growing of coffee, there's a lot of choices to be made. Since we saw the agricultural revolution worldwide more than a hundred years ago, and with the proliferation of coffee, we also see that um, the obviously in the growing of coffee, there's a lot of inputs as we call it. And these inputs are usually chemical driven, petroleum, oil driven inputs like fertilizers, like pesticides, um, and all these uh, inputs create a certain carbon footprint for your cup of coffee. And at the level of growing, we see this. Then at, at the level of exporting, so why at the level of exporting? Because once we start uh, moving coffee from producing countries to consuming countries uh, with cargo ships or with special micro lots, by planes, this adds, of course, significantly to the carbon footprint. Um, 
at the level of roasting, um, in order to roast coffee, we must heat it up. For the roasting, we must use coffee roasters using heat generated either with fuel-based, petroleum-based, diesel-based fuels or with electricity. Also that electricity, of course, uh, has to be generated for which in many cases, fossil fuels are still necessary, but we will get back to this topic later. Then in the distribution cycle, which still happens typically with uh, gasoline, diesel fueled trucks. So all of these steps have to be taken into consideration in this coffee value chain. We also have at the level of retail, um, here you have to think of all the distinct steps that are necessary to make from a roasted bean, a beverage, the electricity needed to do that will require fossil fuels of some sort. Also, um, when we talk about all the elements that feed into a cup of coffee, like the cup itself, the straw, whether it is from plastic or from paper, we have to think of the interior of the um, cafe. Um, we have to think of all of the other steps necessary to refrigerate the milk that goes into the coffee. And talking about milk, here we're actually looking at um, an ingredient that is because of the fact that milk is produced by cows that we already know creates a large carbon footprint. This milk by itself on a relative scale adds tremendously to the carbon footprint of our cup of coffee. And so here we see a comparison where we see at the top of this chain, the carbon footprint of beef versus lamb versus prawns versus chocolate versus fish and other food products. And here we see on a relative scale that coffee actually scores relatively low compared to these other food items like beef, lamb, prawns, chocolates, etc. cetera. Um, and tofu, which is the replacement for beef in terms of its proteins, beans and nuts, also have a much lower carbon footprint. So I think at least that is um, a reason to feel somewhat um, relaxed as coffee professionals, that our carbon footprint is not nearly as high as it is for some of these other food items, these food products. There have been um, a lot of calculations made on, um, if you look at the, the coffee consumption at home, um, if you're looking at the range from different types of um, machines or applications that you use to produce your cup of coffee, that if I do this with an automated machine like a Jura or a Saeco or that type of machine, my carbon emissions per use in the case of an automatic machine can be as high as 100 grams. Um, while if I'm using um, a single cup preparation at home or a French press, then my carbon usage will be significantly less typically. And you can see all the elements that go into this carbon usage from the agrochemicals that go into um, the production of the coffee, the fertilizers, the pesticides, the cultivation, the processing, the pre-processing, the milling, the roasting and distribution, 
And um, you can see that one cup of coffee on average generates in terms of your total carbon quota per day, it takes up 0.5% of that carbon quota um, per day. And this carbon quota has been um, calculated by a um, uh, organization that very specifically looks at how much carbon we ideally should use. If you would look at the consumption of other food items, you will see that this is way, way more. Now, how about uh, if we look at the consumption of our um, uh, coffee now with milk, or let's say if we have a cappuccino. Um, in the US and in Europe, it's just to some degree quite similar. The uh, uh, almost 80% of consumers drinks his or her coffee with milk or with cream, whether it is cappuccino or a creamer. And a gallon of milk produced in the US has a carbon footprint of 17.6 pounds of carbon dioxide equivalent. And one gallon is 3.8 liters. So we're looking in here per liter of milk, um, well over four pounds of carbon dioxide equivalents. And the same study done by the University of Arkansas here in the United States showed that dairy production as a whole accounts for about 2% of the total US greenhouse gas emissions, um, which is of course much less than the generation of electricity but it's still quite significant. So you, you see in this small, smaller picture on this slide, on the right side, you can see uh, a comparison between dairy, regular milk, and then um, replacement types of dairies like soy milk, almond milk, and PEA. And you can see that these types of um, alternatives, you can add coconut milk to this. Um, um, take into, if you take those into account, they will have a much lower carbon footprint. And then if you look at, you know, if you look at your consumption over the course of a year, and if you're more like an espresso per person, then you can see what this adds to your carbon footprint. Obviously, that is way lower than in the case of a uh, cappuccino or flat white or a cafe latte. So lattes have a carbon footprint of about 0.55 kilograms, followed by cappuccinos, 0.41 kilograms, and flat whites, 0.34 kilograms. But when you produce the coffee in a sustainable manner, then these values, they fall down to respectively 0.33 kilograms towards a reduction of uh, 20% or 0 0.2 kilograms with a flat white or 0.13 kilograms in um, the case with a regular cup of coffee. So using, in addition to producing coffee sustainably and obviously as a consumer or as a roaster, you don't have uh, direct influence on this, but as a roaster, you can um, focus on coffees that are produced with less inputs, less fertilizers, uh, chemical fertilizers, or less pesticides, or that are being used, produced organically. And here we can see on a scale of carbon emissions um, with a conventional coffee up to uh, 0.6 kilograms per serving, 0.6 kilograms of carbon emissions. If this coffee would be sustainably produced, it's much less. Or if this coffee 
um, would be sustainably produced in a non-dairy type of milk, like a soy milk or a coconut milk would be used, it's significantly less. But obviously, in order to um, change our consumption patterns, we will have to accept some flavor differences also. So we cannot um, take our response, personal responsibility and our personal preferences, we cannot make those independent from um, the, um, uh, the behavior we apply towards our carbon footprint. And then if we look at the life cycle of coffee cups, and this, you know, I'm referring to the typical cup, which is a, um, um, in coffee bars, it's um, throwaway cups, disposable cups. But if we compare those with ceramic cups or with travel mugs, then um, you can significantly have an impact as a coffee um, entrepreneur, as a coffee retailer, as a bar owner on um, your carbon footprint. So reusable travel mugs, they are not always better um, in terms of the carbon footprint because they have a relatively high level of unembodied energy. That means, you know, a reusable travel mug is, used, is often made of uh, steel, stainless steel. And to produce that, you need a tremendous amount of energy. In order to have a positive impact on the carbon footprint, you will just need to make sure that you use this travel mug um, sufficiently over time. And um, another study conducted by the Technical Research Center of Finland, the VTT Research Center, had similar findings. And so, this study showed that about 5% of the total carbon emissions of a takeaway, of a takeout eight ounce latte were from the single use takeout cup and lid. So that's relatively high. And so thinking about um, alternatives to disposable um, cups is important, but the vast majority of carbon emissions are from the coffee itself, from the production of cycle of the coffee and of the milk. And so the conclusion is when it comes to the type of cup to use, it's to drink coffee from a ceramic cup, like the cup that I have here in my hand, which is a beautifully crafted cup by my friend, um, Heather, who has a, a studio right next to our house. Um, and so when this ceramic cup is used diligently over 350 times, then it starts uh, benefiting in a really tremendous way, the um, environmental impact of your coffee consumption. So how about, you know, how do I become carbon neutral? And this is a question that many, um, roasters, many retailers are more and more of these retailers and roasters are asking. And so, so when your carbon footprint reaches zero, often referred to as net zero, then the brand, your brand is to consider, is to be considered carbon neutral, but it's not very easy. And in order not to um, fall back to production techniques that are set back like in the prehistoric ages, it is important to, to look at options to offset your carbon, carbon footprint um, with other interventions. And so how does offsetting your carbon footprint, how, do, how can that work? And so you can balance out your emissions um, by connecting with companies that are specialized in um, environmental schemes. Um, and that can be a reforestation, 
or green energy like solar energy or wind energy or oil regeneration uh, for example the the reuse of uh, certain cooking oils which is a very uh, growing the popular way to generate energy and if you're looking at reducing your carbon footprint you can purchase so-called carbon credits and these credits for which there are um, a large number of organizations institutions that facilitate the purchase of credits they can be um, the funds that you invest in this can be allocated in reforestation product projects or other projects that have uh, a so-called circular goal so um, once you are getting closer to the ability to offset your carbon footprint in this way you can try to become even carbon negative which means that with the footprint that you generate as a coffee retailer, roaster, exporter, you can actually um, contribute to the uh, offsetting of this CO2 generation by helping to support, for example, reforestation projects. So what about coffee farms? So, and I can speak a little bit from my own um, experience here. I'm a producer of uh, at um, three small farms in Panama. And so at a coffee farm, your choice can be to embrace um, farming using shade trees. And this combination of coffee trees and shade trees is a really excellent way to um, facilitate what we call the highest level of uh, photosynthesis. So plants, whether they are coffee trees or shade trees, they take in, they inhale the carbon dioxide and the water, and that generates a chem chemical process. And as a result, they release a byproduct, oxygen. So this conversion of uh, CO2 in oxygen is uh, a really important process that um, coffee firms can assist in. And photosynthesis, you know, it occurs naturally in coffee plants because without photosynthesis, coffee plants would not be able to blossom or they would not be able to produce fruit. So the production that we use for planting, fertilizing, harvesting, processing, roasting, and then later on production uh, and distribution. It means that in most cases, each plant's photosynthesis is not always sufficient to balance out the emissions generated by cultivating it. And that of course creates the importance of um, thinking about um, uh, ways in which you can offset your carbon footprints. And so you can, uh, as a firm, like Daterra Coffee Estate in Brazil, they adopted um, sustainable agricultural methods like agroforestry. They grow their coffee plants among trees, shade trees. And in their case, the terrace case, they have 6,800 hectares of farmlands. And only half of that is devoted to coffee production. The other half is for conservation. And so the other uh, benefit of this sustainable type of agriculture is also, it will help you as a farmer to improve soil health, which will um, positively impact coffee quality over time. The other example is um, a farm that we own in Panama with some partners from Equator Coffee. Um, it's a roasting company here in California. And this farm in total has 20 hectares of which uh, five hectares are 
pure forest and 15 hectares is our farm. And I'm going to see if I can play a brief video. It might not work because then in that case, I will um, explain some of the essence of this. And I'm trying to play this video right now. Let me do it this way. And I think we have a bandwidth challenge here, which makes it hard to play this video right now. And I'm going to give it one more shot. So unfortunately, seems like this video is not playing, but um, you can, um, look this up in uh, YouTube and find th this video, Finca Sofia Panama. And it's a video that highlights um, the farm, the immense number of, the tremendous amount of um, shade trees that were planted at this farm and, um, and how we have strategized in that way to offset the carbon footprint not just at the farm level, but also at the level of uh, the operations of Equator and at the operations of Boot Coffee, because we all um, use certain types of energy, fossil fuel driven energy for our operations. So you're welcome to look up this video because it's a really cool video produced by my friends from uh, Equator. And um, I'm going to continue to the next topic. Some supply chain solutions that have been um, implemented by various of the companies we have been and that we are collaborating with. So first of all, um, I recently came across um, a really interesting concept and it's called, uh, the, the company is called Good Coffee Farms. They're, um, among others, they're located in Guatemala in the um, region of Jalapa. And they have a vertically integrated coffee supply chain where they use carbon neutral coffee pulping stations. These are actually stations powered by bicycle driven um, motors and you know literally bicycle driven and for the after the pulping is completed they use solar coffee drying stations so these are so-called solar dryers that uh, don't require any additional energy i have a video here which well, very likely because of our bandwidth issues won't play. I'm going to give it a shot. And unfortunately, this does not play. I'm so sorry. Um, let me go back to the presentation. And so this gentleman, and there's also a uh, video connected to this. And for those of you who are watching, we will forward to you the links so that you can uh, look at these uh, videos in your own, at your own leisure. Um, this is um, Mr. Kentaro Fijiwara. That is one of the founders of Good Coffee Farms. And he explained to me uh, over a, um, yeah, a personal um, conversation what his personal vision is and how he has been able to bring into realization um, his dream of reducing the carbon footprint of the coffee industry. And you can see here this photo, here we are looking at a pulper, which is driven by a bicycle driven, bicycle operated motor. 
and it works really well. Um, their entire good coffee farms, and they produce uh, quite a bit of coffee, well over 700 bags of 60 kilograms annually. Um, they produce all their coffee using these um, ecologically powered tools. In this case, the poppers, which basically create from cherries, the so-called parchment beans. They also use um, solar dryers, just drying the coffee with the radiation of the sun only. And that's really a great, uh, great concept. And another example of a uh, very creative, environmentally, energy-friendly solution is a solution for the coffee transports. Um, we know that the transport of coffee using container ships, cargo ships, uh, is very energy intense. And this company, Take Coffee, and they operate in uh, Switzerland, they have the concept of so-called community supported coffee, which is basically a form of direct trade connecting um, their roasting company, their clients, their consumers directly with producers. And they have these collaborations with coffee farmers in Mexico, in Oaxaca and Veracruz. And instead of using um, cargo ships for the transportation of coffee, they use sailboats. And, this concept has been replicated in other countries as well. There is a um, company called Tres Hombres, Three Men. Uh, that's the literal translation. Uh, they're based in um, uh, the Netherlands, my home country. And in the case of Teke Coffee, they integrate their concepts with so-called carbon sustainable retail concepts. And so this is really a very different out of the box approach to the transportation of coffee. This is an actual shot from taken during their trip. As a roaster, you're looking at this and you think, wow, what is my, how about my precious coffee? Is that going to be damaged with the um, ongoing um, humidity from the sea. And obviously this requires um, unique solutions on the side of the uh, transporter to protect the integrity of the quality of the coffee. There's an, uh, also an interview here um, with one of the founders um, of um, this company, Teke, which is really cool explaining their vision and uh, the why and the how of what they do. So, so what, how about Giesen? So how is Giesen addressing um, the importance of becoming um, as a uh, roasting company, as a retailer, as a player, an actor in the coffee chain, how is Giesen addressing the carbon uh, issue, the carbon footprint issue? And there's um, uh, a category of um, roasting systems developed by Giesen, which are fully electrically operated. And you know, of course, if you roast coffee with an electrical roaster, you still have to generate that elect electricity somewhere. But nowadays, depending which country you operate, more and more energy companies use solar and wind energy, or they could use other type nuclear energy in some cases, which has a relatively low carbon footprint as well. And so the Giesen W6E, which is a wonderful machine, it um, combines all the benefits of the Giesen roasting system with drum speed control, airflow control, power regulation, but it's now powered by an electrical heating elements. Of course, you know, the experience roasting on an electrical roaster 
is not exactly the same as on a gas roaster. You have to anticipate more. But I think, you know, this is one of the ways in which you, as a smaller roaster retailer, can um, dramatically increase your carbon footprint. If you look at the total coffee cycle, um, roasting only takes 10 to 15 percent of the typical carbon footprint um, of the production of roasted coffee. Why? Because most of this carbon footprint is generated much earlier in the chain. There's a beautiful video. Um, you should check out Giessen's website as a, at Giessen, GiessenCoffeeRoasters.eu. And there's a beautiful uh, video of this um, roaster in general. The Giessen website is very, very informative on the machine options out there. And then, of course, in those um, cases where you have to think about, you know, how do I um, deal with my roasting exhaust? How do I filter that? There are, of course, the the older, more um, conventional approaches like the afterburner. And this is, you know, represents a real dilemma, right? Because afterburners are often mandated, required by um, local authorities throughout Europe or in the US or in Japan um, as being the best technology to deal with roasting smoke. And this happens in countries where the same governments are now also at the table in Glasgow trying to limit their carbon footprints. So here you have an, elect an electrostatic filter, the SFE, which is uh, offered by, by Giesen, which works quite well to filter out um, the smoke particles, uh, the dust particles, and some of the odors. So it's, it's a solution that works quite well. It helps companies deal with the issue. But now here you have the dilemma, the crazy situation that the same uh, local authorities that are in countries that are um, high on their pedestal on carbon footprint reduction, they will still require these same companies to use the most polluting, most energy inefficient ways like afterburners. And this is a big problem. Um, there is just a hypocrisy on the level of governments and how to deal with these um, international global issues, um, carbon footprint reduction, and how to deal with that successfully. And I hope over the years to come that this will change. Uh, Giesen is of course working hard to develop other um, sustainable creative solutions for this issue, for the issue of uh, finding technologies, applying technologies that will help reduce the carbon footprint of the Giesen roaster family around the world. And we, of course, are the first ones to um, update you on that. So now I want to kind of get into the last part of this, this talk, this presentation, and present a little case study of a small coffee roasting company um, in the US. And they have actually named themselves, branded themselves, as a zero, zero carbon coffee company. Um, it's actually their brand also. It's kind of cool. And what they have done is they have successfully been able to, to calculate exactly their carbon footprint um, going from you know, the, uh, how the coffee was produced, how it is um, roasted, how it is packaged, and they have been able to offset their carbon footprint by um, supporting all kinds of different initiatives that facilitate this. There are 
companies that allow you to plant uh, trees and in return for that um, carbon footprint reduction through these trees, you can reduce your own carbon footprint. So you sponsor such company to in order to do this. And as they recognized in the coffee value chain, most emissions come from dairy milk and brewing. And that's at the point of consumption, not at the farm and not from transportation to New York uh, from South America. And um, they were able to um, zero carbon coffee, they were able to achieve climate neutral certified status um, in 2019. And you can look them up online. They have a very cool uh, website just talking about this. And this is an example of a company that's just highly uh, visionary. And some could say, you know, they're highly uh, out of the box with this. But given the importance uh, of this topic, I feel that we all in the coffee roasting community um, have to look at ways how we can take our own responsibility to uh, contribute to this important, very important aspect of carbon footprint reduction. Um, and last but not least, oh, here you can see some of their bags, Ethiopia, Guatemala, Sumatra, um, some of the um, labels, um, there is a, a climate neutral certified mark that is created by an organization. You, you can look that up. I really recommend you all to study this topic more in detail. And last but not least, I want to, I'm listing some sources for this. So what I uh, suggest is that we will send you um, this PowerPoint for this presentation and you will find within that PowerPoint also all the links that will give you access to the videos that I was not able to show, unfortunately. And you can see other uh, sources that I have used um, for the information for this webinar. Um, so this is, of course, a huge topic. Um, will require many other follow-ups um, as part of this um, this discussion. And I hope this um, was useful for you. We um, again at Gießen we take this extremely serious. Um, for us, sourcing the materials for our roasters requires us to think about you know durability longevity of the roasting machines, which, which adds over time to the carbon footprint reduction of our machines. And I also encourage you to come and check out um, our um, demo facility in California at Booth Coffee Campus, my campus. Um, we use a whole array of uh, Gießen coffee roasting machines and then also you should be in touch with our friends and colleagues of Gießen USA, David Sutfin and Katie Cates, uh, GießenUSA.com. And that's it for so far. And I'm just going to see, um, th there are some questions about, you know, tell us more about the W6E. I would love to do so, but I think we're kind of running out of time here. So I would suggest um, get in touch with uh, your local sales representative, your local Gießen sales representative to have that discussion. Um, I think, you know, there's other benefits of the Gießen W6E as well, is that um, the cost of installation can be quite a bit less because you don't ne necessarily need the type of gas lines you might need for a gas powered roasting machine. Uh, and we will see more and more companies switching to these types of uh, roaster solutions. So that's it so far. Thank you very much. Uh, have a great weekend. Um, and um, we will see each other in a month from now, the last Friday of November. Um, and stay safe, stay healthy, stay happy. And we will see each other soon again.
拜拜。